Fact check. Hello, hello. Let's give them all another round of applause. I, I gotta ask you the first question. Uh, no animals were harmed in the making of any of this, right? Absolutely not. Okay. I, is, is this working? Hello? Hello? Yes. There you go. No, I, I gave you my word. <laughs> <laughs> um, boy, these pretty much covered every topic imaginable to our society today. Uh, you know, what, what we just saw and having grown up in the South really hit me hard because I remember um, seeing and uh, obviously there's, I think, blatant racism all over the world uh, and in this country, certainly not just limited to the South, but it was very overt for a long time over there. Um, how did how did you how did you focus on that and, and give us a little backstory to to Cora? I think uh, uh, let me address it first as a general question that uh, uh, pertains to the four films we just saw. I think that uh, has a lot to do with the, the variety of topics that you mentioned. Has a lot to do with the diversity of the student population at Santa Monica College. Uh, it's something we're incredibly proud of, that our students come from all walks of life. And as you saw, the films that they're making are not really derivative. They stem from their own life experiences, from their own backgrounds. They're talking about things they know, they feel, they have something to say about them, they touch them deeply, and I think uh, that's how they managed to get to the screen. The films are made by 25 students in the class, and I think our role as uh, their instructors is to help them achieve what they set out to do. But the films are incredibly different. It's something that we feel really good about, and it has to do with uh, the complexity and the richness of our student population. How, how long has the program been going on over there? It's a fairly new program, the film production program. Um, it has been going on for five years. Um, we had a very strong critical studies program, uh, which deals with uh, history and criticism and so forth, but uh, we didn't have a film production program as such. And uh, the administration thought that it was uh, high time to do it, and uh, they did one of these uh, searches, and I was uh, fortunate enough to get the job, and uh, my, um, the premise was to create a film production program that would be competitive and, uh, and you know, something we believe in very strongly uh, is that uh, it's about the, the talent, the hard work, the passion uh, that the students bring to the projects, which has nothing to do with socioeconomic backgrounds. So you we did all those films in five years, though. Yeah. Well, way. actually, you just saw a selection of four. We're, we have made 11. We're about to start number 12, uh, a Western, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, we're, we're very proud that these things have nothing to do with socioeconomic background. I think the, the culture in the US is that uh, usually when you attend film school, uh, you know, the film programs cost fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 per year. I taught in such schools. I was teaching directing at USC before coming here. And uh, that makes it very challenging. And students can go in debt for the next 30 years of their lives and so forth. And we really wanted to make a program here where that wouldn't be the case, that we would have a high level of education at the lowest possible cost. And that the, the, the bets that we're placing, as you just saw, uh, with these films is on the richness of the stories and the, the hard work and the passion of our students. I, I suspect it's a lot easier to make movies now than it was, say, 30, 40 years ago. Is that true? I mean, can, I mean, aren't we doing that with our phones right now? Is that, I mean, we're, we're, we're making narratives all the time. 
Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, obviously, this is just a subjective opinion. I'm sure a lot of people here would think differently. I think uh, we have more access than ever to technology, and sure, films are being made with the iPhone and so forth. But I think by the same token, we are perhaps producing more low-quality product than ever before. And uh, <laughs> the internet is flooded with it. It's very hard to come across. That's very accusatory, by the way. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, as I said, it's a subjective opinion. You're I mean, is that a? I mean, there, I there are more um, products. I mean, and yeah, so because well, there are more products sure, out there, it, it right? Can be a, a statistical. Right, thing, right, right. But uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I'm. I'm very proud that the 11 films we've made, I think, are pretty terrific, and uh, and I think because they have that level of craft and first and foremost because they have something to say. And, uh, and I can't emphasize that enough. I think when students make films that are derivative, at best, it's a decent copy of what Tarantino is doing or when you, something When like you that. say derivative, what do you mean by derivative? That, that they're emulating these filmmakers that they admire very much, somebody like Tarantino or Scorsese, and nothing wrong with that. We learn from the masters, all of us, but I think it's really important that in terms of the stories and what they have to say, it stems from within, from their life experiences, from their backgrounds, from you know things that they know intimately, not because they saw it in another movie or on TV, but because they lived through it. How many of you in the audience are connected to Santa Monica College, the, the film program? Wow. All right. At least we're not in Pasadena today, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, wh where do you see this program going in the future, like 5, 10, 15 years from now? Well, I hope uh, that it grows. It's really, it's still in diapers, believe it or not. Uh, we, we have a three-course sequence uh, that focuses on making these short films. We have a cinematography class now. Believe it or not, when we made Solidarity, we didn't have a cinematography class really? yet. I, I still don't understand that uh, in terms of how it happened. But again, I think it's the students pulling miracles. And uh, we want to start a production design uh, component now. We have a, a sequence in screenwriting that is very strong. We have terrific screenwriting instructors that you just witnessed. And uh, it's about growth right now. We are hiring more instructors. And, uh, and I think uh, soon enough, maybe within a couple of years or so, we might be in a position to make a, a feature film that is competitive, that is all made by the students. And I think that would be wonderful if we could do that. Tell us a little bit about, because some of these were, were entered, uh, we talked about Cannes, right? A couple of them were entered in Cannes and, and other festivals. So, uh, give us, I guess, a, a synopsis of the accolades that you have. Um, be, I mean, be, be, you know, be it, modest here. <laughs> it is a long list. The films That's have good. gotten really well. Give us the biggie. Uh, well, uh, Solidarity and Cora uh, did make it into the Emerging Filmmakers uh, competition at the Cannes Film Festival, actually. Uh, Cora was there last week, uh, the director and producer were here with us, uh, Kevin and David just came back from Cannes, and Latarsha, the actress, and I hear that uh, it played very well over there, and uh, Solidarity won uh, also at the Munich Film Festival the award for a film that promotes intercultural dialogue, and the premise of that festival is that they divide the top film schools in the world. There were only three from the US, I believe it was NYU, uh, Chapman, and us. And, uh, and of course, that made us feel very good. Uh, Bird uh, just won a prize at the Mexico International Film Festival last week. And that's not even a student festival, that's just an international festival. Hurt won the uh, Remy Platinum Award at the Houston Film Festival. And uh, something I'm very proud of, the Santa Monica International Film Festival, which is hosting this event. Uh, awarded Solidarity Best Short Film and uh, Bird Best Screenplay and so forth. And again, look, the, the thing about the accolades is that it brings legitimacy to the program and, uh, and it, it helps, from my perspective, uh, promote what the students are doing. It's nice when you feel that you're not the only lunatic who believes that these are good films. It's nice that there's some acknowledgement out there by people who know about these things. And, and that, that's really what it's about. I, I think these are incredible films. If they never won any accolades, I feel the students feel the same. But it, it, it's good to have the recognition, plus it helps in terms of uh, when you apply for grants and all that. We didn't have any equipment. We've gotten all the equipment to 
Gherkin's grant, and you know, it's part of the equation when people see that the films are accomplishing something, it makes those things more possible. Do we want to bring the others up Please. too? Yes. So, uh, and, they, and we'll open it up to questions to you guys too. So again, I really want to emphasize that the films are made by the 25 people in each class, and uh, I think something wonderful about the program is that there is a collective sense of ownership about the films. I think all the students feel that this belongs to them. Uh, however, as is usual in these kinds of Q&As, we've been asked uh, to have the writer-director here. Uh, two of them are not present for very good reasons. So I'll start with solidarity. Uh, the director, Dustin Brown, couldn't be here with us tonight because he's shooting his thesis film at AFI, at the American Film Institute, which is a very good reason not to be here. And uh, representing Solidarity, we have the main actor and producer of the film, Mantas Valenciejus. Mantas, could you join us, please? Come on, Come on Mantas, aside from being the producer, he is a graduate of the SMC Theater Arts program, so he came from the acting school in the college. Then uh, for Bird, we also have a very good reason why the writer-director is not here. Brittany Ray Barber, a female director, obviously. She is in the Prague Film School, which is one of the most competitive film schools in the world. So she's studying film over there. And uh, representing that film, we have the cinematography supervisor, Vishal Solanki. personal and strong connection with Vishal, because he was my student in 2003 or so at some other school, and no. now he's a professional director of photography, helping us mentor our cinematography students, along with our new cinematography instructor, whom I just over there, Clyde yeah. Smith. Right. Now, uh, Woo! Thank you. for the next film, we do have the writer-director with us, and this is for Hurt. Brandon Chang. And then for Cora, we have the writer-director, Kevin Maxwell. Call them out, absolutely, absolutely. Mantas, you want to talk? <laughs> anybody Don't leave from, anybody out. Anybody from Solidarity? <laughs> <laughs> Who from Solidarity is here? Alex, <laughs> Alex uh, please, uh, can I hold them? Of course. Yeah, Alex, please, come over. Yeah, come over. <laughs> Do we want them to come down? Or? Well, you can just stand up and let's acknowledge oh, Alex. Acknowledge. Yeah. 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 It's on. We, we probably, do we have, are these all the mics that we have? Or do we have any more? Yeah. So I guess nobody else from Solidarity. <laughs> well, why, why don't we start, we can start, and I'll ask a question, I guess, the first one of, uh, of Montes. First of all, where are you from? I'm Lithuania. Lithuania, okay, very nice. Um, how was that pig, by the way? <laughs> that was a cute little pig. I don't know, I never checked back on it. You never checked back on it? I hope it's fine. Um, what, what was it like? I mean, this obviously, the, the solidarity, I guess we want to explain what the solidarity is. I think we figured it out, that there are two people who are sort of intertwined in the world who have never met one another. But you're wearing a shirt that she made. Um, she's eating the meat that you prepared at the butcher shop. I mean, how, how did that come to be? How did, how did the movie come to, to fruition? Um, well, it's, it's, it's all Dustin. Dustin Brown is the director of the film. He, uh, he came up with the, with the main story. Basically, he came up with the <clears throat> first half. He came up with Elpidia, uh, Elpidia Carrillo, who plays the lead character. Inez. 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 So he came up with her first, and uh, you, the whole story was based on her. But uh, later on, because we were like, you know, best friends, then he was like, hey man, okay, do you wanna be in the film? <laughs> because before, no, no cronyism here in LA, no. Because before Solidarity, we did, uh, 
the, the other two short films. Uh, one was No Solace, uh, and another Becoming, and the, the, the first one I played the lead also, and in Becoming I just happened to produce. So I, w I really was like hung, you know, hungry to, to act, and uh, so he specifically wrote that, that, that part for me to be in front of guys. It that's how it came about. It, w it was so interesting to me because this is a movie that, that where you are, it, I mean obviously it's about immigration rights, things like that, you've got, you've got um, um, the fear of being deported, you've got the fear of, of, uh, of, of working in a place where you're not making a lot of money but you really have no choice and, and I thought it was very telling the fact that um, you know the bosses kept saying look you have no other choice, they were exploiting that and we see that all the time yet at the same time you're, you're passing shops you know with probably made in the USA but people don't know the people who are making those things proudly in the USA. Uh, which I think is dynamic. I mean, the, the way that it was it was portrayed on, on screen. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, well, Dustin is such a such a social justice fighter, and his brother is a is a sociologist. So, you know, when we meet, basically, that's all they talk about. <laughs> so everything they see, everything in America, what's wrong, and let's make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's that's what he does. So I have to adjust to all these, like, I'm not saying I, I agree on everything what's, what's happening in America, you know, I'm, I'm myself a foreigner, so I see a lot of good things about America, but, you know, the basics of, of, of this film, of course, coming from uh, social injustice. Uh, should we talk about, uh, uh, who's next, Bird? Bird. Okay. You can have two. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Bird, uh, well, there is Julie and Joseph, and, and uh, they've helped almost all the films getting a um, lot of background because, you know, background actors are taken for granted as well. And we have uh, amazing uh, background in all these movies, and they somehow managed to get the right people for Bird, uh, Bird all the movies, and they're here right now. So uh, I want to thank them. They are here. And, uh, Also, I know, I know, I think he's lost his trouble, but I still recognize him. We have the colorist of uh, Bird and Cora both. At Sony Pictures, he colored both the films. He's responsible for uh, Ooh, yeah. It's only a good experience for a cinematographer to see the colorist. He's not regretting anything that happened. Um, and uh, if anybody else, I haven't, I, I wasn't in the screening itself, I was outside. So if there's anybody else from board, just let me know. Um, and yeah, I, guess. I, I loved how, and I told this to Salvador earlier today in the lobby, I loved how you guys made Los Globos a, um, a strip club. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it was one of those things, I mean, look, you wanted, you needed a CD scene, and I guess Sunset Boulevard over in Echo Park was probably, you know, I mean, as seedy as they come, or, not anymore, though. I don't know. There are a lot of folks who live in Echo Park. But um, wh what was the premise of that movie like getting made? In, in in that we're talking about drugs now. We're talking about a child of of a man who's selling drugs. I mean, wh where did that come from? Well, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to give exactly the details, but let's let's put it this way that uh, Brittany had a good sense of that world uh, already from uh, you know however her experiences were. So. Uh, because it wouldn't be right for me to give those details, uh, but she had a good sense of the, that environment and that milieu, uh, and she wanted to do something dealing with death uh, and sexuality combined, um, and that's how this this script emerged. I mean, uh, she and Chris, uh, you know, they had prepared a longer draft, and then uh, what you're seeing is, is is an edited version of that. So. Uh, it's pretty much uh, it's her idea, and and uh, this was her uh, first, uh, you know, like a baby kind of. So, how did it emerge? It's it's just like it, it was her story. What were, uh, I guess, were there any technical issues that you guys had to deal with? Because it was it seemed like it was shot mostly at night, mm -hmm. right? Well, I mean, since you brought up Los Globos, um, that was. You thanked them in the credits. Yeah. I thought, I thought, uh, yeah. 
that was tedier in reality than it is in the movie. <laughs> uh, we had some, I, I can't even give that details because the guy will probably get, lose his job. But let's say we, we, we had done some cabling for the lights, which technically you're not, you're stealing power in a way. Um, and we had no permits, I think, from, from that night. Um, we literally put a no, big... No permits from Film LA or from who? From anybody. <laughs> and, and, and from, from what I know. Uh, and and, and uh, we put a jib. We built a jib with full confidence. We put a taco stand for the crew over there to eat. And um, we were rolling at it with a real movie production and nobody asked us anything. <laughs> so is that, I mean, what, the, because in LA, well, that's not a strange sight to see, yeah, right? We were just confident in, in how wrong we were, and we just got the job done and left. <laughs> is that, that's a great LA story right there. I, I, I feel great. compelled to say that this was one of our early movies. Now, <laughs> now we go by the book. No, 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 I understand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other illegally made movies here? No. Uh, uh, is there anything else you wanna you wanna talk about the movie or? No, I mean I think I think uh, both uh, Chris and Brittany they really slogged. We worked very long hours actually, um, very long hours. Uh, in a in a good sense, it was it was uh, needed. Um, I mean things took longer than anticipated, but it was like a debut for both of them in a way and. Uh, it was it was good. We had some onset issues to deal with uh, logistically sometimes, or with, with performance or acting or whatever. But uh, I think in the end they got what they wanted, and um, we shot some parts of it maybe three months, four months down the line or something. Did some pickups and uh, all together. Where where was the freeway shot with the fence overlooking the, the uh, it's, freeway? It's it's uh, it's it's. Uh, Somewhere in East LA, yeah. um, exact street he'll know probably. Five. It's on the five? five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, on top, on top. Boyle Heights. Heights, yeah, yeah, all right. Just quickly, because yeah. otherwise I'll get in trouble. I just remembered uh, a crew member of hers who is here, uh, the pianist, my daughter, Cassandra. trouble with your dog. Oh uh, uh, yes, you will. Absolutely. Um, all right, uh, Hurt. Uh, what was your name yes. again? Brandon. 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 My name uh, is Brandon. And th this was um, a movie that we saw in the epilogue uh, uh, that was finished just days before the, yes. the shooting on campus. Yes. Um, it was a definitely a sensitive subject that uh, we were dealing with, and yeah, like came up with the idea beforehand, before the whole thing went down. And I mean, it's unfortunate, I mean, uh, Santa Monica. I think there was like a couple uh, like scares around campus, like around that time. Also. There had been false alarms, yeah. Yeah, so it was kind of weird timing. In the interest of full disclosure, we're also KCRWs on the Santa Monica College, which I'm sure all of you know, but that was, that was quite a day. Yeah. Um, why that topic, why that subject? Um, we wanted to tackle, I wanted to tackle uh, an issue that felt important to schools, um, because I was going to school, and um, school shootings popped up into my head, and I was like, how can I capitalize off of this? <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Maybe not capitalize, but to bring attention to bring attention. a bring very attention. macabre subject. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we did it. Did, was there any, I mean, because it seems like there, look, I mean, we, we have no shortage, unfortunately. It, it, it's something that we talk about a lot, gun control in this country and, um, and, and mass shootings that happen. We had one today, as a matter of fact, in Houston. Um, right. I, I don't, I mean, is, is does making a movie like this make people think about this more? Does it make them angry? Does it? What, what does it do? Do you think it gives people ideas? What do you, what uh, do you think it does? I think it brings attention to the subject. Um, we were trying to like create a discussion by 
making a movie like this. Um, I mean, I don't think people or kids would like get some sort of idea just by watching a movie. Kids and can get ideas from a lot of things, not just watching a movie, absolutely. Um, I was telling Salvador earlier today in the lobby, we, we had a nice ch long chat in the lobby earlier, but I told him, I said, you know, the thing about her was the fact that it had a happy ending. And he corrected me, like, quickly. He was like, well, it was, a, it, it was, it was an ending that was, I guess, nicer than the alternative. But he said, w what did you tell me? You said, yeah, but that gun was still in the bag. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's terrific, obviously, that he doesn't carry out what we see uh, he was about to do. And, and that's it's an ambivalent really ending. Say that again? It's an ambivalent ending. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that also makes you wonder you know, when these things happen, what if somebody had seen this person and talked to them and reached out? So in that sense, of course, it's, it's, it, it is a happy ending that... Uh, Today you know, it didn't happen, but maybe happen. next time, you know? <laughs> well, we, you know, we know what she has in the briefcase, and, uh, and, and actually, I mean, just a brief anecdote, uh, we, we, used, we had the ending of the movie was just that Dolly in Whitney's eyes, and you know we were meant to speculate what was in his mind, and then the Santa Barbara shooting happened. I was in Chicago at a time uh, doing a screening of a film of mine, and Brandon and I talked for a long time on the phone, and we decided that to reflect what had just happened in Santa Barbara. This was the Isla Vista, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it was a good idea to bring in, as he just said, a bit of. Uh, ambivalence to it that we actually see what's in his mind and you know the the thoughts are still there and we just don't know what's going to happen next but we we wanted it to be thought provoking in that sense that the audience can participate like okay what can I do about this if I need somebody who seems to be having these issues it, maybe there is something that we can do and I think something that's quite special about hers is that they're having movies about this, uh, but they had a different viewpoint. I mean, most famously, Gus and Sam's Elephant, where there's just no hope, no chance. I mean, they're completely psychotic. They kill people, and that's all there is to it. And here, for Brandon, it was very important to humanize the character. Uh, that Because this kid was more or less justified me, himself. like, in high school, I'd say, about the the shooting and the it was, it was you? It was you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that we talk about, the, the, the bullying that happens in high school. Um, uh, I, I, and, and you're right, it does bring it to the fore. People understand what happens in high school, and, and, and I mean, the only thing you can do is just draw attention to it and hope that, that people learn from it. So, um, thank you, Brandon. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Kevin Maxwell. Thank you. Aura. It's your grandmother, right? Yes, it yeah. is. Uh, can I, is it possible to acknowledge the team? Of course. Um, so first we have uh, we have David Field here, which is the producer. He did a phenomenal job. This is talented. And Padre is that on. Can, you, can, can he come up? And Do you want to come up? Sure. You can come up if you want. Just sure. say something like that. Just a few words. And next we have uh, we have James Nichols, the guy in the yellow shirt here, the one that got hit with the shotgun. Uh, really good job. <laughs> he actually rehearsed uh, everything before. Then we have Latarsha Rose. Uh, in the of the song on the week. Where is she? Stand up, Latarsha. There she is. Wonderful, wonderful afternoon. We have Daniel Holly, who is our post-production supervisor. He did a great job. Great job. <laughs> we have David Bernstein in the back, who also did Bird, he, the colorist for Cora. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. The no, it's right. Drew. <laughs> Drew Davis in the back. <laughs> great guy here. And then we have our associate producers, wonderfully talented associate producers, Joseph and Julie, right here. They, great job. they actually found a house that we have in the movie, the, 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 the old house. There. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, the Chevy, the Chevy truck pulled up. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful They're house. responsible for that. Yeah. Where, this was set in Tennessee, right? 
You said Memphis, Tennessee. Yes. Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering. What, what year was this? 1966. 1966. So this was um, three years after Four Little Girls. Yes. In uh, my old stopping ground, Birmingham, Alabama. Absolutely. Birmingham and Memphis are like twin cities. Yeah, almost. absolutely. Um, race, it, it plays, obviously, and has played and continues to play even to this day, um, such a, a large, profound political, socioeconomic role in, in our country. And your grandmother <laughs> left. And well, the one thing that I, that I, at the end of the movie, when, when she left, she got on the bus, and I kept thinking, what about the little boy, though? What about her little boy? <laughs> right? This is your dad. Yeah, that's my dad. That's my she reunited with him, though. She reunited two months later with him. Two yes. months later. Yeah. How did she do that? Um, what happened was when she left Memphis, Tennessee, she left with two dimes in her pocket. So she left her business, she left everything behind. And when she arrived to Los Angeles, she used the two dimes to make phone calls. And she had a job in about two days. That Monday, she had a job. She started her home cleaning, um, her home cleaning job, and then she got a business out of it. And then what? What she did was, after that happened, she kept calling home out to Memphis, checking on my father. And what she didn't know is that Winston in the film kidnapped him because she was trying to, he was trying to get her back out to Memphis. And what happened was uh, the mother, my grandmother's mother, wouldn't tell her. So the whole time she stayed there for two months, building up her business, her clients and everything. And then uh, some family members came out and brought him back over to Los Angeles. That's so cool. Yeah, so that's very cool. Fascinating. Yeah. Is, I wonder. I mean, because it, it's it's a period piece, and and, and we, we it's a snapshot in time of what of what happened in, in those days. How did your How did your grandmother tell you? I mean, this this obviously is a, is a labor of her telling you the storytelling. Absolutely. You, right. Yeah. How did that happen? Did she tell you as a kid or? No, actually, I I didn't know anything about her upbringing at all uh, she she actually raised me so I didn't know anything about it and I was actually in a government position um, and so, some, some unfortunate circumstances some things happened and it, it made me grow curious so it, it was consciousness one it was about how strong women were and especially in the african-american community and how they created this uh, this cohesion in families like the men would uh, go to jail things would happen especially in the 60s different things like that, but they would stay strong for the family. So I started to ask her questions like, how did you get so strong, grandma? Like, what happened? Tell me more about it. And what happened, actually, she had a stroke and she was on her deathbed and, uh, it, it, you know, it almost happened. So uh, I started to ask her questions about her story and she just filled me in. And I was actually uh, thinking about doing a documentary and I wanted to go to different cultures and study the strength in women from all different cultures. But when she told me her story, I was like, wow, I want to share this with the world. And um, that's, how, that's how it happened. And she, she had her own business in Memphis, which I think yeah, is yeah, extraordinary yeah. in its yeah. own right. You know, a lot of people don't realize there were the, you know, the, 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 the white water fountains and, and the colored water fountains in, in the South, the segregation, Jim Crow. But that the black people in the South did have to eat. They did have to go to places. And a lot of those businesses were black owned. Absolutely, yes. And I mean, uh, you know, when she, she learned all her business acumen from a Jewish family out in Memphis, Tennessee at the time. And that's how she uh, got the skills and she ended up starting her business from it. So it was actually really successful. Uh, she had to leave everything she was connected to. And uh, just uh, that's why it was really interesting to me. It was really shocking. I, I want to ask this and then we'll get to your questions in just a second. Um, Kevin, because you, as I mentioned, this is like a period, like like in time. How do you go about making a movie that's set in the 1960s? That's that's pretty tough, right? Finding finding oh, the truck absolutely. and finding the house. And absolutely. Look, I'll tell you this: uh, if it wasn't for Santa Monica College, I uh, wouldn't have been able to do it. I'll tell you that. Like it was really ambitious. I didn't know how we were gonna do it. Uh, I met David. I met Salvador, our professor, mentor. Met Vashaw and the associate producers who all came together and their skills just kind of coalesced and, and made it happen. So it was like this, it was the power of a team actually. And that's what made it really, really happen. That's how it happened. Because unfortunately I wouldn't have been able to find and all these different resources and tap into them if it wasn't for that. What, what are your plans for this movie? Uh, we actually want to adapt it into a feature because it's so many different 
so much more to tell in terms of her upbringing, uh, Winston's background, what she did when she came out to Los Angeles, how she succeeded, and what she went through after that until she finally kind of learned her lesson. How did she do in L.A., by the way? How was, I mean, look, racism knows no boundaries. It doesn't just end at the Mason-Dixon line. I mean, right? she, 1966, she moved she, out west. Who knows what was happening? Up she there. actually yeah. said she ignored a lot of it. Actually, it was the, the the domestic violence aspect of all of it was so terrifying to her. For for one, she she thought she was in love. She thought this guy loved her. It was a lack of education back then, and uh, and there was there was so many different aspects to it. But then when she got here, she said that one thing that she had to do when she faced racism was. She couldn't go into the front door of people's homes. Uh, she actually had to go to the back door. Uh, it was different things like that, but she said it was actually a lot less worse here in Los Angeles than out in Memphis, Tennessee. So it, was, it wasn't too big of a deal, but they did they get, they did give her flack over actually owning a business here too. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You guys have any questions? We have a, a, do we have an extra mic or I will give you mine? So, Steve, could Latarsha join us? Of course, come on up, Latarsha. <laughs> oh, chivalry ain't dead. Or it, maybe it is. All right. No, not dead at all. All right. Um, I saw a hand first. Who had. Uh, I'll, I'll, you, ma'am. I'm loud. I don't need a bike, I don't think. You sure? Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, because Latarsh is here, your performance was totally extraordinary. You yeah. are a chorus. <laughs> you are amazing. Thank you. Could somebody talk about the casting process and how you found each other? That's like a little film miracle. Okay. So, my friend Joel, Joe Holt, who is an actor that I've known from New York, I'm from New York. Um, he called me one day. I was working on another show. I was working on a show and I was on hiatus. And he said, first of all, it was the first project that I was offered a role. <laughs> he was like, um, we'd like to, he's, uh, we'd like to offer you this role. He was working on the project because another friend was in the producer program. And I really trust Joe with everything. And I said, sure, let me read it. And I fell in love with the story. Um, and it really, it's labor of love role. And Joe ended up casting a lot of the other actors, and we all sort of knew each other from other projects or opportunities. Um, so that was a blessing and a wonderful opportunity to work with everyone. It was really just a beautiful experience. And Joe Holt basically helped in. I don't know who else. Who did he play? He played who? Winston. 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 Okay. And actually, we met Joe through Salvador's contact, the, the contact named Amy Sloan. Um, who was in a producer's program, and Salvador um, linked me with her, and uh, she introduced me to Joe. We sat down uh, uh, under Salvador's uh, discretion or suggestion. We sat down at a restaurant, and Joe just got it. He got it immediately, and that's why I, I fell in love with Joe's thinking, and, uh, and I trusted his decisions from there. And once he introduced me to Latarsha, Latarsha came in to rehearse, and she cried all cute, and that's when we all fell in love with her. And, uh, she she and cried all cute? She cried on cute. Oh, on cute. On cute. Like, on cute, no. And I cried cute. But I will say this, you can't Questions for the others too. We've got everybody over here. Anybody? All right. You back there in the lock? Me? Uh, or you? <laughs> Just start talking. I have a question for Brandon. Um, I was really interested in the fact that you chose to tell the story from the point of view of the almost shooter, right. and uh, and and brought a humanity to the whole thing. I thought it was really extraordinary. What, uh, you said, mentioned that that was sort of your experience in high school, and where did this come from? What where did you um, get that? More or less. Uh, I tried to make it as personal as possible. Um, I guess, 
with some of the school shooters, uh, what we know of them, kind of paints a picture of someone who's like maybe isolated and uh, doesn't fit in. So I sort of uh, relate to that. I think telling a story from that perspective uh, made it um, an easy story for me to tell. It's a great job. Thank you. What kind of thoughts did you have when you were in high school? When it, I mean, were you were you bullied? Were you? Um, yeah, or I think I felt more invisible, which is like a common uh, theme for the Aaron character. Um, did you ever meet anybody who also felt invisible? I did not, unfortunately. There was no blonde, hot blonde girl. <laughs> <laughs> How did she appear? I mean, you know, this is about personal experience, right? I mean, yeah, that was right? Fictional. That was fictional. <laughs> Did anybody reach out? No, I don't know. Still here? You are still here. Still here. He's still here. Yeah. <laughs> that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Indeed, it does. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, okay, you, sir. Um, for, thank you, everyone. The performances were absolutely fantastic, and a lot of times with short films, you don't really see the performances as fleshed out as they were today. Um, so as actors and directors, what was the collaboration like? Was there a rehearsal process? And especially since these stories were so close to you, um, at what point do you, do you give it to the actor to let them explore? And what, what was that process like? Anybody want to tackle that one? <laughs> How was your exploration project process? Well, for me, it's, it's I, I, I dig in and I do a lot of dramaturgy and research, especially it's, it was interesting, especially since I had the director, the writer, who was so, so close to him. And it was a little <coughs> rough at times, just because <laughs> it's so personal for him. But writers, for anyone who is a filmmaker, who are writers and directors, you have to really, if you're going to choose an actor, you have to trust that they're going to bring your character to life. Because yes, you've written it and you put it on the page and someone else lived it. And not, the actor isn't, isn't acting the life of the, the character, but they're bringing to life and revealing something about that life. So it's not the actual, but it's, it's a glimpse of it. And you have to trust that going to bring it to life. And over time, it really became that. It became a collaboration. Um, it was just a really sensitive story, and there's a lot of stuff that happened. Um, and it really became, we became very impassioned about a lot of different things. And, but I will tell you this, it's one of those things, yes, it's a short film, yes, it's a student project. You know, I was, I was literally, at the time, I was on hiatus from my first series regular roles. So that's like the big job. You're like, oh, great, I'm series regular. And I had done some other big projects, and I've been doing this for a long time. But let me tell you, this is where my heart was. I was like, we were at late nights. I, I mean, I have many injuries from that. <laughs> we, we actually actually got hit. We had an actual. And yes. so the actors fall. We do fight what choreography. Mean, got hit. It was slapping we were doing fight choreography, and it was our fault. We didn't reset. Whenever you fight choreography, you have to reset, and we did not reset one of the tapes. And so I actually got hit. And what's interesting is, and this is an actor thinking that they know something, I said, you know, I really don't think a woman my height and weight wouldn't be knocked down if I got smacked. <laughs> Fast forward, I got knocked down, we get smacked. <laughs> we stayed there on the ground and we thought, we were like, oh, we hope they got that. That's what you rank us, we're like, right. I got blood in the game, I hope it went there. That is a take in the movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so you used it. It was real. Yeah. You know, if I could work like that on a regular basis, it would be a true joy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bless you, Monica. Yeah, by the way, it was very, very great acting. You did an amazing job. And uh, I really liked uh, Hurt, the actor in Hurt. It was, uh, he was like, fantastic. I don't know if he really went there. So, um, no, I wanted to say, yeah, basically, it's 
a lot of, a lot ha has to do with re rehearsals. Uh, in this case, it was Santa Monica College specifically, and uh, right. you know, you go through the rehearsal process and you see the best pick. But you know, long story short, I just wanted to say one thing. I, I always say this. Uh, you know, every time when I have to do Q&A, I did this film, uh, No Solace, way before I came to Los Angeles, and that was my first short. And when we screened to Salvador Carrasco, at that time, we were, that was at the UCLA? LA Film School, I'm sorry, LA Film School. And uh, I didn't have any act, acting background by that time. Like, and he came up to me and he said one thing that I'm always using and you know, all this all this like acting thing, you know, wishy washy thing for me. He just came up to me and he said, like, just I love No Solace because you were like very honest. So anything you do is for me is like is like you can read, you know, books, you can go like, you know, sit in a bar, get drunk, not get drunk, do pull ups. You know, whatever you do, whatever it takes for you, but you have to be honest, and it it picks up on you, on the screen. So as honest as you are, the better your performance will be, I guess. So, I guess for quote unquote Salvador Carrasco. Can I just piggyback on that? I will have to say that um, having Kevin and having Salvador, Skidowit was a student program, a project, and it was such sensitive matter. It, having the trust and knowing that I had Salvador and Kevin and Salvador guiding the students and all of the heads of their, the different departments, that was so important that that allowed me to really give myself over to it instead of everything that we were getting into. So, thank you. <coughs> really a special experience. Yeah, I think the, the way we make these shorts at uh, Santa Monica College is uh, rather unusual. Um, it is truly a team effort. Uh, we have, as Latarsha just said, uh, the heads of departments there. The last three films, Clyde has been there with us on set. I couldn't even start thinking about these movies without uh, the support, the loyalty, and the friendship of Drew Davis over there, who's yeah. our production <laughs> coordinator. <laughs> And, uh, and it starts with the very first class that we teach, the introductory class on the first semester, uh, where students get introduced to the equipment. And uh, I, is Simone here? I don't think he's here, but uh, also a great collaborator who gets them started and the whole process is streamlined. And this is the capstone class. And one thing we do, just to allude to the question about the acting that I think is uh, quite special, is that we film the scenes in class. So we do film rehearsals, and it's something that I'm incredibly grateful to Latarsha and the others because they are professional actors and they come to the class. And we, we film there with uh, mock-up things. So we use, you know, the Western that we're preparing right now, we're using cardboard horses <laughs> and uh, easels and chairs, but the idea is to pre-visualize the whole movie uh, shoot it, edit it, and then we know what works, what doesn't work, and then we go on location and do it for real. And I think that accounts for a lot of why the films work. It's a, that it's a team effort and there's a lot of work from a lot of people involved, and obviously, without the support of the administration, this would be unthinkable either. How do you know the difference between, I, I can imagine the first day of school in your film, like, let's go back five years ago, or even, even the first part of the semester, when you have all these students who come into to your class and you look at these students and you have to differentiate, you have to sort of delineate between, you know, because every there, there are people who want to be a filmmaker and then there are people who really want to be a filmmaker. Can you, can you understand that difference? Because there are a lot of people who just want to shoot with their camera and, you know, screw around and... Well, uh... No, I can't, because I think that once they're exposed to the program, they all will want to be uh, filmmakers, <laughs> which I think the other thing that's different is that we do not cater to just above-the-line positions. So the SMC film program is not just about directors, producers, cinematographers. For us, it's fundamental, the work of assistants, grips, gaffers, editors, everybody. So they're all important, they're all equal, so we believe that there's a place on a film set for all of them, 
they're doing what they love, they're passionate about it, and they can make a living from it, and guess what? It is happening. They do our two-year program, and they're getting jobs in the industry, and they're supporting themselves from this philosophy that the college has. We call it CTE, Career Technical Education. So the idea is they go through the program, and they can get jobs or transfer to the best film schools in the country. So it, it really starts with a philosophy and then acting uh, coherently. But uh, the, the other thing, what happened five years ago when this started, I, I basically thought, what would I have liked when I was a student at NYU? I, that's where I studied film, or when I was teaching elsewhere, what would have been my dream? And my dream would have been to do these shoots with instructors teaching and supervising and challenging and let is, letting us achieve what we set out to do, but as Latasha was saying, also feeling that you can experiment, that you can try out something crazy because there's some, somebody there, somebody is in plural, watching your back. So that was a dream. I never had that experience at NYU, not once. And, uh, and that was the premise here, that maybe we could create a program that would offer that and it is happening, and I think it has a lot to do with that. More questions? Yes, sir. Uh, just to follow up on something that was said both by and about Salvador and all of you, uh, it isn't just the uh, diversity or the richness or the complexity of the program, but the fact that the whole school provides this funneling of creative energy and look what it manifests itself as. I mean, just look at the group in front of you to see the uh, uh, aspects of extraordinary diversity. And uh, I, I've had both high praise and disagreements with Salvador, but I have to say that uh, it's clear to me from the results we just saw, he's pretty much a genius. <laughs> 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 On that note, we're going to thank our filmmakers for coming to you. Before we go, I just wanted to say again a big thank you to the SMC Film Program, but also a lot of us wouldn't be here today without the SMC AS, the Associated Students, speaking to what the gentleman said over here and, and talking about how this is a complete student production. The Associated Students gave us our startup money to literally make for us, uh, and then sent us on to Cannes, uh, paying for our trip for Kevin and I to be there and represent. And Kevin and Latarsha were very modest. I just have to speak up as their producer. Mm -hmm. Kevin, he, he mentioned it briefly, he literally left a career with the government in Homeland Security. He dropped it just to make this film. Wow. This was a, not just a dream, but a reality. He wasn't going to stop until it was made. And Natasha, she wouldn't even mention it, but she was a regular on BET's Being Mary Jane. She's been on The Hunger Games, Law and Order, Subway commercials, you name it. And she really went out of her way to, to work on this film and, and help make it what it was. And thank you to Salvador and everybody here that has supported this project. Uh, Vishal, everybody, appreciate it so much. Drew. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Steve Pegas, thank you for moderating. Salvador, thank you for putting together this program and for working with these students. We look forward to seeing more of your projects in the future. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to the Arclight this yeah. evening. Please feel free to step outside and continue your conversation, maybe at the bar if you'd like. I know they have an excellent bar here. Uh, enjoy. If you want to uh, support the film festival, go to Santa Monica Film Festival's website, smff.org. Go to our Facebook page, our Twitter. We appreciate all of your shout outs and all your support. And we want to thank, most of all, Arclight Cinemas and Arclight Cinemas staff for all of their support. Thank you, folks. Camera cuts. All right.